I love the way the First Gen Lounge makes me feel. Because it creates a space where I belong, where we're able to create community. The fact that it's a community. It's a safe place. It also gives me a place to understand different perspectives. The stories of these individuals prescribe transformational perspective. I receive encouragement, enlightenment, empowerment. And also serve as a catalyst to just keep going. Where we're able to be our true selves. I'm allowed to be an unapologetic first gen. And above all else, tell our story. And every episode is unique. I love it. I'm your host, Dr. Eve, and I'd like to welcome you to the First Gen Lounge. All right, folks. So I am here today with a Pan-African author, poet, blogger, and child care provider, Miss Nia Newsom, who's a Baltimore native, and I would say a badass. Like, Nia, welcome to the yes. University Podcast. How are you? Hi. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much for agreeing to come on to the show. So just to give you a little backstory, I was lurking on hashtags on IG one day and came across Nia's page. And I was like, wait, what? She Greek? Wait, what? She wrote a book? <laughs> wait, what? She first gen? I got to get to know who she is. So I was like, I'm going to slide them DMs and see if she's going to agree. She did. So <laughs> thank you, Nia. I appreciate it. Tell us a little bit, though. You know, I, I mentioned a few things, but tell us about yourself. Who are you? What is it that you do? Well, like you said, I'm an author, a poet, a licensed child care provider. I recently graduated from McDaniel College. I'm a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. I'm currently in the Alpha Beta grad chapter. I'm a Baltimore native, still live in Baltimore. And I just recently self-published my first memoir slash self-help book entitled The Father's Love. And I'm basically just promoting that and getting that out to the world. You better get it out to the world. So, I mean, while we're <laughs> on it, tell us a little bit about your book, A Father's Love. That's pretty interesting. The untold story of her journey. So what's that all about? Well, A Father's Love is based off of a relationship with my father. It's been a book I've always wanted to write to help young girls who grew up without a father. A lot of people ask me why I wrote it. I basically say I wrote it because it was something I never had. So I wanted to create something that I couldn't find myself. I couldn't find a self-help book that was specifically for young girls or even young males who grew up without a father and express like the effects that it would have, like low self-esteem, relationship with boys, things of that nature. So I decided to create it myself and it has poems, short stories and everything you can think of and it has a present chapter in it where it talks about the relationship I have with my father currently and how it started and how it's starting to progress. Mm, I love that. So out of curiosity, how would you say or or did the lack of a relationship with your father play a role in how you were as a college student and how you've become as a young professional? I think freshman year of my college experience is when me and my father started to get back on the term. So it it wasn't really affected much during my college years. It kind of, that's when it started to like get better. And I would say it was weird because I wasn't used to him calling as much as he would or me being able to call and reach out. Everybody knows that as college students, you have that, hey, I need some money. I'm hungry. The cafeteria is not <laughs> Like, you have those moments, and I was able to, like, ask my father for, like, like, hey, Dad. Like, I never said Dad before. Like, the whole experience was just, like, brand new to me. Mm, nothing like brand new experiences. How would you compare mm -hmm. developing the relationship with your father with being first generation? I would say it's similar because as a first generation college student, you don't really know what to do like you have no prior experience of it because no one else in your family has done it like you're basically the blueprint and with the relationship with my father it basically was the same thing like it was like a brand new blueprint we both were going in like hey we're completely starting over like you know me as a child on and off but now you're getting to experience me as an adult so that's a whole different type of learning experience and something that you need to go through mm, i like that so you're fresh off graduation <laughs> like yeah. literally a couple months ago <laughs> uh -huh. what has life been like for you thus far i would say it's been pretty good i had a job right out of college and interviews and stuff set up so i 
planned it the right way. I was working as a QA proofreader at Calvert Education, but it was a it was a temporary position that ended up ending like earlier than expected, but it was fine. I couldn't see myself being in it long term, so I kind of was happy that it was like a, okay, temporary, get some money type of position because it wasn't what I wanted to do long term. I didn't have like a passion for it. So I'm currently trying to get back into the child care field. So I'm doing interviews and stuff now to get back into licensed child care center and of course promoting the book and just doing that. I love that. What would you say that you enjoyed the most about the experience of being a college graduate thus far? I like the the end. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was so much. I just, like I know you gonna so miss funny. it, girl. You gonna miss it. <laughs> Yeah, like the satisfaction of like being able to do it, like being a first generation college student. I'm pretty sure all college students have like meltdowns and like be going through it. But as a first generation college student, since you don't have anyone to go to or to say like, hey, I'm going through this, going through that. And even if you talk to your parents, they've never been to college. So they don't understand like I got a paper due at 12. I ain't even technically start. It's like 10 o'clock. Like, just the, the stress of trying to get the deadline. And then as being a Zeta, and I was president my senior year, I had to oh, worry about yeah. I had to worry about not only carrying my chapter, but I did my senior capstone my last semester, so I had to balance that as well. So, like, the stress of just having to continually do a bunch of things would be a lot. So, my happy experience is experiencing it, like, it's, it's done. I completed it. I did everything I set my mind to. That's the best feeling. Hmm. I have a question. because I mean, of course, I have a lot of questions, but something that just came to mind. Would you say that trying to do a lot was your way of trying to prove something to yourself or somebody else? I don't think so, because there wasn't really any expectation because, like I said, you're the first generation or you're the first one doing it. When I went to college, I kind of thought that I would be the same how I was in high school. Like in high school, I did most every club and everything that I was in was mostly academic. So I didn't think I would be the college girl who would party, join the sorority, do these different things. It kind of just happened unexpectedly as the time went through. Like I just kind of like, I say all the time, like they the kind of like fell into my lap like it wasn't something that I went to school to become Greek or anything like that it was just something that happened with the women that I've met and experiences that I've had on the campus so you're fresh out of college you're already an author what do you dream of for your life going forward well I always wanted to be an author since I was 10 so my dream would be to continue to write books, continue to do poetry and all the writing things that I am doing. I wish that my blog would be more popular and getting that material out. I also wanted to do more programs and stuff based off of my book, like maybe do some kind of like retreat. I had the idea of doing a panel with like fathers and getting their idea about what they think of the book and different things of that. So just continue to write and build different organizations, maybe a start a nonprofit, just doing a, a bunch of different things. Yeah, you like to be busy, don't you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with that at all. I'm like, yeah, she on the move. Like, she got a lot of plans, which I love. Tell us a little bit more about your blog. What is that about? I started, I restarted. I had a blog a while ago, but I wasn't really dedicated to it as much as I am now. So I restarted a new blog in the title, Nia's Open Heart and Open Mind. And I basically get, sometimes I get topics that come to mind, or sometimes I get topics from like social media. Like I ask people like, hey, what do you want to hear me write about today? And I post them, I try to post every other Sunday at 12 o'clock. And it just has different topics, love, mental health, happiness, different things of that nature. I think that's dope. So let's think a little bit about, I mean, because you are clearly accomplished and very vibrant and very go-getting. So I really love that about you. At what point did you experience adversity that just really made you take a standstill? And what was that thing? How did you get through it? I can't remember which year it was. Maybe like sophomore year. I kept going to social media like, look, 
or to give up. I don't even know why I'm in school. <laughs> I really was like doubting and questioning myself. Like, I was like, I, I just don't see why I'm even doing this. Like the classes I was taking, I wasn't feeling them. The professors was irritating me. I was hungry because I didn't like the cafeteria food. Everything that the <laughs> experience for me sophomore year was just like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And of course, like, you, what you put on social media, everybody like, no, girl, you got this, you smart, and all this. And then, like, my parents like, you'll be fine. Like, everyone goes through it. So just having the encouragement of other people, it, it helped. But I also had to, like, let myself know, like, hey, this costs a lot of money. The government is paying for you to go to school. So you need to go ahead and do this. You said you wanted to do it. Can't be a quitter. So just having to like see positive affirmations to myself and let myself know like, hey, I can do this. I said I would do this and had to get through it. Very nice. So being that you are first generation, you went to school, you decided that you were going to become a part of a sorority. But mm -hmm. in generation, what was the teacher interest in becoming a Zeta? So I went to McDaniel College in Westminster, Maryland. So for people who don't know, it's a predominantly white institution in Carroll County. And Zeta was the first MPHC sorority at the campus. So when I got there freshman year, I seen like all the sororities and all the clubs that wasn't really interested. So freshman year, I basically went to class, ate, went to my room, and hung with friends. Like that basically was my freshman year. Then sophomore year, I started to have friends I was like, Hey, there's a sorority on campus. They're the first black one on campus and, and such things like that. So I decided to go to an interest meeting and I learned about it and so it was interesting. I was like, oh, this is cool. But still, I was like, all right, it's cool, but I really don't want to be in a sorority because my idea was who wants to hang around a bunch of females out there? Like, that was my perspective <laughs> of what, like, a sorority is like, I really want to be around a bunch of females out there. This is a little So they, they had other events like game night and different things like that and I went to their game night and it just was like wow like they're really cool they were genuine there was a sorority sister which is my pro fight now Jewel she took us to parties and different things like that like she really was like trying to get to know us and she not only did she was trying to get to know us she let us know like hey even if you don't join Zeta like I just wanted to like get to know you and talk to you about different things she even let us know history of the entire NCAC so it wasn't seem like hey you have to be a Zeta you have to do this and that and I thought that that was really like humble and like nice for her and after that I just kept going to the events and started the process you know I love that I think that's dope and the reason being is I didn't have anybody in my family that was Greek that I could look to to become uh -huh. a part of organization so being first gen you're like uh, okay <laughs> It was actually a fraternity that piqued my interest in Greek life at all. And it was Alpha. And the guys uh, were and really down to earth. And then they kind of started inviting me to events when I started to learn more and more. And long story short, I ended up pledging Place Delta. And I was so glad I did because I love that community and the connection to other people, to other women. So I was kind of like, uh -huh. do it first. Too. Like, what? I wasn't trying to be no... I know catty women all day. Uh -huh. <laughs> Men can be petty sometimes too. So, you know, for what it's worth, it's all about building each other up, especially in the black community. So kudos to you for, you know, having having taken that that turn and being a part of it and then becoming chapter president because leadership is definitely something that you're about. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, this girl is getting it. Like reading your bio, <laughs> like, all of this, I mean, National Honor Society and Kyle's Brown Foundation and peer group connection mm -hmm. like I mean when did you have time to sleep <laughs> you know like <laughs> so um it's kind of like getting into something you know when we think about taking time to, to, to just for ourselves when I said when did you have time how have you been able to balance your life or work through the transition and take care of yourself since graduating because you went from having this cushion you know in, in a sense mm -hmm. in this discomfort to uh oh yeah I'm done but uh, shit getting real yeah well currently i keep a journal and i write daily positive affirmations i write like five a day and for those who don't know what positive affirmations is it's just things that you say to yourself positive because we're so used to speaking negative things to ourselves like oh you're not doing this not doing that so to reverse it i see positive affirmations say keep going you're doing good this that, and the third and i also started working out again so like at school it was easy because i barely was eating the food 
that was there for the eat salads, <laughs> grilled food, and to to eat right at school was was actually easy for me. And then I had full access to a gym, so it was easy to go to the gym every other day and work out and eat right. And being back home, I got used to oh the corner store is right here on the corner. Like everything that I need was like an easy access to me. So I had to get my mind back right to like speak affirmations to myself, getting back into eating right and just staying on a positive path. Plus the neighborhood that I, I live in is not a typically positive neighborhood. So that even motivates me more like, hey, you need to keep striving, keep doing what you're doing so you can get out of this neighborhood and get to your own place and, and have those goals that you want to accomplish. Oh man, that is perfect that you said that. That was a great segue to my next thought. How has the folks back at home received you since you've gotten back? Because you miss educator now. You know, you miss college. Or uh, you, miss you know, like how, how has that been for you? Have you experienced any resistance? Um, I don't think so. Most of the people here, like, like I, where I live at now, I've been here since I was a child. Like, I literally was, like, here since I was a baby. So most of the, like, older people here have seen me grow up since I was a child. So they're, like, most of the like, older people in the neighborhood are really happy and mm-hmm. excited for me. And most have already bought my book. So, like, they're supporting financially by purchasing the book and reading it and letting me know what they think about it. So, of course, they'll, they'll probably always be people who are resistant, but I, I haven't ran across any people who aren't happy for what I'm doing. I love that because it's a different spin to what we usually hear that people don't support us or understand us or aren't there for us. Mm-hmm. And there are cases, though, you know, just to be straight up, where individuals can be low key hating, and we know it. We know, but they don't have mm-hmm. the neighborhood. But I know sometimes the adjustment going back and having a different experience within itself um, sometimes changes people's perspective of who you are when you come home. So shout out to your community for, you know, holding you down. Like, that's, that's big. I love that. I definitely love that. Speaking of support, and I'm thinking about how people help us along, you know, life in just different ways. What would you say is the best advice somebody's ever given to you? Best advice someone has ever given to me. I think I would say when I started, like, selling my book and writing my book, I would look at other people who had, like, business and seeing what they would do. And one person told me to buy black but sell to everyone. At first, it didn't make sense, and I was like, huh? And then I was like, oh, buy black but sell to everyone. And we, in the pan community, we try to keep everything black, keep the black dollar circulating in the black community. So we should be able to buy black, buy from our brothers and sisters, buy from people who have the same skin tone as us. But sell to everyone. Don't limit your product or limit what you have and say, oh, I'm only going to sell to my people because then your money won't quickly the way you need it to. So buy black and sell to everyone. I think that was the best advice I've ever gotten. You know, that's something I've never heard before. It was a very interesting yeah. concept. Very interesting concept. And I want to say it's bad. It's just something that makes me want to say, I need to think about that for a couple of days. You know, in other communities that I want to say, in, you know, my opinion, the cultures stick together a little bit more than sometimes we do. That maybe mm-hmm. that might as well, you know, keep the money in the family and within, you know, our network of folks, but make sure everybody's getting the product. But I guess it's how you buy them too. So um, very dope, very dope concept. So I got to go. I have to go here. And this is definitely not a part of the plan, but I, I just got to. Me as a poet. <laughs> when the last time you did something, Miss? You said the last time I said something? Yeah. It's, it's been a while. Like, since I've been, because I, I am working on a poetry book as well, titled The Evolution of Nia. So, like, that's been, like, on pause since I've been promoting this book. So, it's been a while since I've, like, written something new or went to an open mic night. So, I'm, I might be a little rough. <laughs> you ain't got to, you want to share with us right now? To share something? There's uh, another chick, and I'm going to tell you about her. Her name is Elise, and she's over the platform Fatness Fiction. But similar to ourselves, she's a, a poet. She's just vibrant. She's all about pushing culture. And I think that y'all would, you know, hit it off. So I didn't ask her to do it. So I got to make up for it now. So Mia, what you got for us? Okay, so I have a poem entitled My Heartbeat. Want me to just spit it? Do your thing. It's all about you. <laughs> okay, so on paper, I'm a U.S. citizen, but my heart beats for Africa. I'm stuck in a country where I'm told to respect my captors while they sit back and laugh at us. Laugh while we put each other down. Laugh at us trying to be successful. My heart beats for Africa. My heart beats for the motherland. Beats for where it all begins. 
It beats for the freedom to be myself. It beats for the diamonds, the gold, the culture, the wealth. It beats for the folk tales from the elders, the wisdom from their past, the encouragement to prepare for a better path. My heart beats for Africa. My heart beats for the sound of that drum beat, with that image in my head of that black Wall Street. My heart beats for unity, beats for reciprocity. My heart beats for my society. My heart beats for Africa. My heart beats for my people. A people who are kings and queens but forgot their worth. A people who could do so much if they weren't so hurt. Hurt by society who hit their life on the daily. Hurt by society who don't give a damn if they make it. My heart beats for Africa. My heart beats for my ancestors. Beats for what they've been through. Beats for the return to our continent that's so beautiful and true. Africa, my heart beats for you. I'm like, snapping. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. You got me over here like, oh my gosh, like, I need to sit down and write. I've been trying to write, but my, my brain just been dusty. So I'm like, you know, so I'm, I'm, I need to get it together. That's what I'm saying. I ain't going to trip. Like, I, I'm doing it all, but my, yo, that's beautiful. I appreciate I appreciate that. Uh-huh. Thank you. People listening appreciate it too. That's something like new. Like, get it, girl. Get it, get it, girl. Okay. So, um, as we're wrapping up, I'd be interested in knowing if there's anything that you want to leave listeners with on today. That's that one message, that one take home. What would that be? I would leave listeners with never give up. Like I've wanted to be an author since I was ten. And most people don't don't follow their childhood dream and say, oh, that's just something I wanted to do as a child. But I continue to push. I told every English teacher that I've ever had since the fifth grade, like, hey, I want to write. And they've been supportive. I've gotten college writing material when I was in, like, middle school. So, like, just if you have a dream, never give up and keep following it. That's real. That's real, Nia. Where can we find you in the social media space, the internet space? Where do you want us to, to follow you? On Facebook, my name is Deanna Newsom. On Instagram, it is Nia the Divine. And my website is www.theurbanauthor.org. Thank you for sharing that. Nia, you have been an absolute pleasure to connect with today. Your energy is amazing. Your your mindset is beautiful. I have no doubt in my mind that I'm going to look back in the next three or four years and be like, mm-hmm, just don't forget about me, Nia. Don't forget about me. <laughs> so you are you're definitely like, to, to be a first-generation college graduate, to come from a place of hardship, to have not had that relationship with your father, for you to still be so upbeat and so vibrant, to be healing that relationship, to have just so much poise about you. I am totally in awe of you and I admire you greatly and I wish you nothing but the best as you continue to go forward in this life. Thank you. You are so, so very welcome. (laughs) 